<laughs> I'll try my best. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me here this morning to give a talk on the Dhamma. I have to admit that I don't, well, you're aware that I don't know any of you except Sanka, who was kind enough to invite me to Sri Lanka and uh, organize tickets and place this accommodation and arrange. Uh, places to where I was wanted to teach. I also don't know why I'm here or where this is. So <clears throat> I have to uh, improvise on what I'm going to say. I'm not a Buddha. I don't have magical powers that I can read your minds and tell what you want to hear. But I do know something about the Buddha's teaching, enough to know what is useful for people, what is most essential and most appropriate for a large group of people. So for general audience, we have two kinds of audience, of general audience and specific audience. And if you read the Buddha's teaching, you can see that this is also the case. Some of the Buddha's teachings you can't teach to everyone. They were for specific audiences. You know, if you teach mindfulness of death, some monks end up killing themselves a mindfulness of the loathsomeness of the body. They get disgusted with the body and they decide to kill themselves. It can happen. And some teachings are for a general audience, so they're applicable to many people or most people or all people. And then there are the shallow teachings, the general uh, basic level teachings, and there are also the deep teachings. And so some teachings you can't teach to a basic audience, someone who doesn't know anything about the Buddha's teaching because they have different views and opinions and beliefs, and so you have to address those. And if you give basic teachings to people who are strong practitioners of the Buddha Dhamma, then they get nothing from it. So it's a little bit of an issue to teach how to teach. So what I think to teach, <coughs> I think it's predictable actually, is I teach the four Satipatthana. So today, what I want to offer to you, something that you, many of you probably know, but I hope to say things that you may not have heard before, is to talk about the Maha Satipatthana Sutta. You know, forgive me if you've heard these things before because you haven't heard them from me, I'm quite sure. Some of these things I, I teach on the internet um, so some of you may have been following what I teach. But I'll try to make it interesting and useful and, and hopefully we'll still have time at the end to sit in meditation together. Because in the end words are, are only concepts, they can't they can't bring enlightenment, not in the way your own observation, your own investigation can. All they can do is offer a map. It's up to you whether you are going to use that map. <clears throat> so
So the Satipatthana Sutta is is useful. I think it, for many, for those of you who are, who know of it, it's, it doesn't require much explanation. But there may still be some some uh, uncertainty as to how important the Satipatthana Sutta is. I mean, I think most people know it is important, but then all of the teachings of the Buddha are important. Maybe only some people should practice the Satipatthana and some people should practice something else, or maybe you only practice it when you start, or only practice it when you're almost enlightened or something. The truth is that it's very easy to believe that or reasonable to suggest that Satipatthana is the heart of the Buddha's teaching. The commentaries had, a, had an opinion on this. The commentaries say that all of the Buddha's teaching if you if you take the whole of the Buddha's teaching and uh, distill it down to one one word, actually, do you know what that word is? It's a compound word. So one one idea. Can you guess what that word is? Those of you who some of you know the Buddha's teaching, I'm sure. Yeah. Most of you. What is the core? concept of the Buddha's teaching. The commentary gave it, so you, it is, there is an answer. It's not just a guess. No. Huh? Very good. Appamada pada is what he says. Appamada pada meva otarati. It goes down to the appamada pada. The pada is the path to appamada. Appamada is, I think it's not, many people don't come up with that right away if they're not really, really clever, really uh, well versed in the Buddha's teaching. I think it's partly because in Sri Lanka, Pramadaya has taken on a different meaning. <coughs> Pramadaya, what does it mean in Sri Lanka, in Singhala? It means to be, to procrastinate, right? But that's not what pamada means. In Pali, it doesn't mean to procrastinate. Because drinking alcohol doesn't lead to procrastination. Well, it does, but that's not the most important thing. It leads to pamada. It leads you to be negligent, to be unmindful. So satipatthana is is essential because the word sati uh, is used to mean uh, the act of being not negligent, of being apamada. The Buddha said satiya avipavaso apamado diujati. When one is is never without sati, this means one is apamada. Furthermore, we have the sutta itself that tells us this. You know, how does the sutta start? Eva me suttang ekang samayang bhagava kurusu. He was among the kurus with a large group of monks. And what is the first thing he says in the Satipatthana Sutta? What's the first word? You know the Satipatthana Sutta, Maha Satipatthana Sutta? You know the sutta? You know the Satipatthana Sutta? What is the first word that the Buddha said? <clears throat> Satipatthana Sutta, you know? A, you know, A. Huh? No, no, that's already, we've already passed that. What's the first thing the Buddha says? Ekayano. You know this? Ah, something new then. Okay. 
See, this is, I have to test you to see what you already know. I don't want to say something that's already obvious. It's not obvious. So I'm talking about why we can say mindfulness is very important. Well, I said, because the Buddha said this means to be not... What does it mean to be apamada? It doesn't mean to, to know what time it is and not be late. That's not what it means. It means to have sati. Always. To never be without sati. When you constantly have sati, then you're not, then you're not pramada yet. But now we have something else. We have the Satipatthana Sutta. And everywhere the Buddha taught, uh, in the Satipatthana Sanyutta as well, it says, Ekayano ayang bhikkave mago. Bhikkave, see here, O bhikkhus, uh, ayang mago, this maga, this path. Uh, Ekayano. Eka means one, and ayana means going or, or way. So this path is the one way. This is how he started the sutta. He, started, he said, I'm going to tell you what is the one-way path, or the path that is the one-way. So, yes, ma'am. So it's a one-way, so you, there's no U-turn to come back once you arrive. This, this is, there's five meanings to the word one-way. One of the meanings is, one of the meanings is, it only goes in one direction. Yes. It, it won't lead you anywhere else. You know, you, you, this path leads here. You follow this path, you won't go this way. You won't go astray. You, you cannot go any other way. If you're practicing it, it will only lead there. Uh, it's also the way, but well, anyway, we don't have to get into that. But um, the point is, that, it, that gives it some importance. Mm -hmm. the, the, to say that this is the Ekayanamaga means something. So when you chant the mantras, it keeps you focused and it keeps you down. Absolutely. On that yes. I'll get into that actually. You keep that keep that word mantra in mind because yes. that's going to become important. Very well said. That about sums up the whole of it, what you just said. Okay. So this is so Ekayanoyang Pikawe Mago and then he says to five things. This is the one-way path to five things. One, to purify your mind, or to purify beings, he said, satanang visuddhya. Two, to overcome sokapari-deva dukkadomanas, uh, sokapari-deva nang samatikamaya, to overcome sorrow and lamentation. Three, to be free from bodily suffering and mental suffering. Four, to find the right way, the right, uh, or to find the truth. Nyayasa atikamaya, to find what should be, to understand what should be understood. And nibbanasa satikiriyaya, to see nibbana for yourself. So you didn't know that, maybe you've never heard this before. This is the one way path to nibbana, satipatthana. Yatitang chattaro satipatthana ti. That is to say, the four satipatthana. So, I say this to give you an idea of how important it is. If you want to know from a Buddha, from the Buddha's point of view, uh, what is the path, what is the way to reach nirvana, <coughs> here you have it. I give you the four satipatthana. So I'll try to explain these briefly and still give some time to meditate together. Okay? All right. First of all, we talk, let's briefly mention what are these five, five things. So p to purify the mind, to, it says the purification of beings. But we have to understand what we mean by purification here. Briefly, purification doesn't mean purification of the body, although that is also important for meditation. Uh, it means purification of the mind. So when you talk about purification in Buddhism, you refer to the mind that is pure. This means the mind that is free from uh, loba, dvesha, loba, dosa, moha, is free from uh, all kinds of uh, defilements of the mind. 
And really this is the most important uh, reason or purpose for practicing satipatthana. It's really the only one you need. Because if you understand the, the spiritual path, for anyone who's following the spiritual path, you can see that this is where the problem is. This is in the time of the Buddha what they understood. It's even today what people understand. Why we practice the spiritual path? Those people who, who understand it properly understand that it's for purification. That the reason why we are not all pure is like we have this beautiful crystal lens, you can say. And it's covered up with dust and grime and oil and, and everything, all kinds of defilements. But they don't, they don't sully the, the, the lens, they don't hurt the lens, they don't scratch the lens. And they just cover it up. Our mind is pure, right? The Buddha said, idang jitang. This mind is pure, is radiant. But the akandukehi akusalehi damehi. Akandukehi. The, the bad things that come in, they cover it up. And so, all the spiritual path is, is to remove those defilements and let the purity that is within shine. This is what our practice is. Once you have no defilements, then there's no problem. All the other things we talk about, no more sorrow, lamentation, no more bodily suffering, mental suffering, uh, to find the right path and to realize nirvana, all of that comes when your mind is pure. This is why the Buddha put it first. So how does Satipatthana, now we have to ask the question, how is it that Satipatthana purifies the mind? Well, first we have to understand what we mean by Sati and what we mean by Patana, no? Sati or Sati Upatana, you can say. What do we mean by the word Satipatthana? Sati is a difficult word because it's so simple. And so in English they, trans they read the t texts and they, tr they tried to think about it and they decided that the best translation for what the Buddha was talking about was mindfulness. Now most Buddhist teachers today denounce this translation and will say, I'm not alone. They will say it's not a very good translation. The word mindfulness, in fact, is better, a better translation of the word sampajanya, which is closely related to sati, but it's a different word. Sati doesn't mean to be aware. It doesn't mean to... Uh, doesn't have anything to do with knowing the object. When you, when you meditate, you take an object. Now it can be an object of devotion or, or it can be a, a conceptual object. It can be other beings. If you have metta as your meditation, you wish, may this being be happy, may that being be happy. Or it can take the paramata dhamma, the five khandas, as the object can take your body as an object, or your mind as an object, your emotions, your pain, or your happiness as an object. So you were sitting on the floor just now, and you got up. Oh, yes. Why? Your pain? Yes. Okay. So this practice will teach you how to use the pain as a, as a meditation. This is an example. So, the mindfulness, what mindfulness is, when you sit there and you're in pain, you're aware of the pain. We don't have to, we don't have to help you be aware of the pain. 
That's not what meditation is. Anyone who says, meditation, you just sit and be aware. Well, there's some truth to that. But the, the key is in the word just. Because you were not just aware of the pain. You had the pain and then... Oh, I wiggled and massaged. That's right. <laughs> How do you get to that state of just being aware of the pain? That's the key. This is what sati is for. Okay. Because, you know, it's been put in layman terms for me. Okay, good. Thank you. There's more. Uh, what sati? Sati is described as grabbing the object or holding firm to the object. And it's kind of curious because we talk in Buddhism, don't grasp, you know, don't hold on. But it's a different kind of holding on. It means holding still. Hold still so that you don't go to the next step of liking it or disliking it or, or, or so on. So you kind of let your mind go from there. Well, I'll, I'll explain. Okay. Don't, don't jump to conclusions. Okay. I, I have to go s step by step. First we have the concept is that... Is it good to practice while you're saying this? Sure, thing? sure. Should I go back then and see how I feel? If you, you can That's if you want. I'm not criticizing you. You're welcome to sit there, but you can try. Well, you don't know how yet. I have to, sh to explain how. Wait okay. until I... I'll tell you when, Thank okay? You. Maybe I'll practice later. I'll tell you when to go sit, Good. okay? Thank you. All right. So, to grasp the object. This is important because that awareness arises and you are aware of the object. If you could just hold on to that and not go anywhere else, not go the next step to liking it or disliking it, uh, that, then you would have no problem. You'd just be aware of the pain. It's hard to believe, actually. Many people will, will, will hear that and can't believe that it's, it's true and are horrified by the prospect of having to be aware of the pain. How, well, how do you escape suffering? Run away from it. <laughs> you're sitting there. If you're suffering, come sit up here. This is more comfortable. I'm acting it out. That's how you escape suffering, they say. But that's called, that's, that's not dukkha satcha. That's not the truth of suffering. That's only dukkha vedana. When you have a headache, you take a pill. When you have a backache, you get a massage. When you have pain in your legs, you get up and sit. This is not understanding the truth of suffering yet. It won't free you from suffering. Because as soon as you go sit down, actually, you'll be more upset next time because you're cultivating dislike of the pain. Right? When you say, it's a habit. Right. So, n the more you, you follow the habit, the more uncomfortable you are with just little pain. Until it gets like this, where you can't sit for a long time. If you force yourself the way the Sri Lankan people do, then, or the Buddhist people do, then eventually you become patient with it and so on and so on. But I'll teach you an even better way. This is the way of sati, the way of mindfulness. So it, the idea is we're going to find a way to grasp the object. Now, you don't worry because you have this already. What did you just say to me that I said is correct? What did you say? No, I, when I said that's exactly what it is, I, I said, you don't remember it. Okay, well, let, I'll repeat it. You said that the mantra... Yes, What? the mantra. What is the mantra? It keeps you in that... Focus. Okay. A mantra is a word that Buddhists don't use so much. It's just strange that we don't use it. In Thailand they use a mantra quite often, but they don't use the word mantra. The mantra they use is buddho buddho. You know this? You heard the Thai people using this? Buddho. They say putto putto if you know. Because they don't, they have strange pronunciation of Buddha. So they use the Buddha as their mantra. And that keeps them focused should keep them focused on the Buddha. They actually use it to focus on the breath, which I think is very strange because Buddha isn't the breath, it's two different. It's anapanasati or it's Buddha nusati. You can't do both together, no? So if you buddho, buddho, it should be focused on the qualities of the Buddha. But they do that as well. Now, we're going to do something quite clever that most people don't think of. This is, it's not me clever, this is the Buddha is clever. The Buddha did something that no one thought of. He taught you to focus on the very thing that you're trying to chase, you're trying to run away from. 
So you have pain and you say, well, my life is full of pain and suffering. To escape this, I'm going to focus on something else. Whether it's heaven or God or Buddha or, or other people or whatever. What is the best way that you could cleanse your mind? I'm explaining it. So if your mind is not clean, we have to learn to uh, see the objects clearly. The mind is clean, but when you experience something you don't like, anger arises. That's not clean. But before that your mind was clean. But when you experience something you didn't like, the pain of sitting on the floor, you get upset. When you experience something that you like, you, you, that's good, you like it. And then your mind is not clean again. So, so the mind is already pure, but the defilements come when you experience. So how do we stop that? How do we change that? So we just experience it. We're going to use a mantra. Something that many people don't understand and think is crazy and... But, it, but crazy or not, it works. Crazy or not, it's actually what the Buddha taught. The Buddha said in the Satipatthana Sutta, we'll skip ahead now to where he actually started to teach. He said, Gachanto va gachamiti pajanati. Gachanto means when you're walking, you should know to yourself, Gachami. Not Buddha, 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 no? Don't focus on the Buddha, focus on the walking. How do you focus on the walking? What's the best way that we know to focus? What is your name? Pramila. Pramila. To be in your body, mantra, mantra, mantra. Ah. Use a mantra to focus. Exactly. Well, I use so many. Okay, well, listen, I'm giving you a new mantra. The mantra of walking. When you walk, I'm going to have you say to yourself, walking, walking, walking. I know it sounds kind of, no, 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 I like kind that. of dull, but... Because I say a mantra instead yeah. of walking. Everywhere. Well, yeah. let's focus on what is the problem. Walking isn't a problem. Sitting on the floor. Sitting on the floor, uh-huh. So, okay, we are there now. okay, now you can go. <laughs> I gotta overcome this today. All right. That's why I'm here. Maybe not today, but we'll start. Oh, well, we'll start working. Of course, journeys yes, ma'am. Okay. okay, so we we'll give a. Sitting. You guys are sitting like Buddha, and I. Well, I'm there. We'll Except give a. We'll give an example. Thank you. An example of how we do this. Okay. A good one. When you have pain, the normal reaction to the pain is to say, "This is bad." Right? We have the pain and when we realize this is pain and then we say that's bad. So instead we're going to say that's that. Right? When it comes to the question of what is it and what do we think about it, we're going to think about it as pain. So the new mantra I want to give you for the pain is pain. Okay? When you feel the pain, I want you to focus on the pain and say to yourself, Pain, pain, not out loud, just in your mind. Put your mind on the object and say to yourself, pain, pain, pain. And try to teach yourself it's okay. If the pain gets, gets stronger, that's okay. If the pain goes away, that's not any better. It just is what it is. Not trying to make the pain go away, just trying to be with the pain. Now in the beginning, if this is difficult and it, you find your mind still slips into uh, getting angry or upset at the pain, well then we have a new mantra. See because the neat thing about sati is you can use, you can grasp onto any object. You can hold on to any object, even your emotions or your defilements. So the Buddha said when you're angry, you just know that you're angry. So if you get upset at the pain and you don't like the pain, then don't, don't keep saying pain, pain, pain. Instead, focus on the disliking and have a new mantra. Say to yourself, disliking, disliking. See, because the mind is a chain, one thing leads to another. 
the anger and the pain don't come at once. The pain comes first and you get upset about it. Now, we can break that chain by finding a new answer. This is not bad, this is pain. You understand? Okay, this is what we mean by sati. That's about it. Okay, now you sit and you try this and you tell me afterwards how the, what the result is. Good. But also listen to what I'm saying because Absolutely. there are. Still be in my focus, but then yeah. Another question just popped in. May I ask? Sure. So when when you said pain, 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 of course my mind went to my ankle, which is having a pressure yes. on the concrete. Yes. So should I like pad myself as beautiful ladies have? You can. Go there? Is that the See, we're not trying to torture ourselves. Yes. We're yes, just trying exactly. to be aware of things as they are. Ah. But. So when the awareness went there, then pain, and then. And then I felt the pain, as you said, let uh -huh. it go, this too shall pass kind of thing. So I brought, okay, this will go. And then well, no, no, don't say that, don't say oh, that. Okay. See, what that's say? what we call putting the cart before the horse. Well, you know this. That means you're, you're trying to be wise, you're trying to be clever. We have to be, we have to be kind of, we have to be, well, you're saying this too shall pass, but you don't, you don't really believe that. Because if you, be, if you believe that, you wouldn't have to get up and go. So, most meditators will do this. They'll put the cart before the horse. They'll say, this too shall pass, it's impermanent, and they'll try to convince themselves. That is not how wisdom works. Wisdom comes, it's like a science project. In a science experiment, what do you do? Do you write down the conclusions first and say, I believe this is what's going to happen, and da da da. No, you take the observation, and based on the observation, you draw your conclusion. That's how meditation has to work as well. All of Sri Lanka must get enlightened. Okay, okay. Thank you. Let me sir. let me go. We have limited time, so I have to get I'm through something. Totally okay. Not. So. I've been struggling for years. Okay. So now, so instead of trying to come up with an idea of how it is, just watch it. Thank you, just sir. be mindful. It's it's hard because it's too simple, mm -hmm. and our minds want to come up with some wisdom or something, but. Yeah, but this is really the key, is we, we have to keep it at just the awareness level. And trust me, trust me, the wisdom will come. Don't, don't try and be wise first. So look at it as though you're a child, as though you're someone who knows nothing about anything, and focus on pain. And let it tell you, let it tell you what it is, because it knows what it is. And it will be very quick to tell you what it is. And then when you don't like it, focus on that and say to yourself, disliking, disliking. Now this is an example of mindfulness. But when we say satipatthana, we mean the four things that are uh, sort of objects of sati. And so it's us this gives us a useful framework uh, on which to practice. We practice sati, the mindfulness based on these four things. These are the four satipatthana and this is the main meditation practice that the Buddha himself taught. This isn't from uh, modern times or a modern teacher or something. It comes directly from the Buddha who is our, our head teacher. So these four, many of you know already, no? Kaya, Vedana, Chitta, Dhamma. These are worth, when, when people come and do meditation courses at my center, they have to memorize these four. So if you don't know them yet, you might want to take these down and keep them in mind. This is, these are the Pali words. I'll explain them in English as well. Kaya, Vedana, Chitta, Dhamma. Kaya means the body. Vedana means feelings or sensations like pain and pleasure. Chitta means the mind, so thoughts or, or mental activity. And Dhamma, Dhamma is a word that we're still fighting over. It's hard to explain exactly what the Buddha means here, but I stand by my explanation, and you can argue with me if you want, the teachings of the Buddha the dhammas that the Buddha taught. So, because you practice mindfulness of kaya, vedana and citta, these are already dhammas. But these are basic dhammas of reality. 
we're not just trying to stay in, in samsara. We have a path to follow. So on that path, you have to be aware of the dharma of the Buddha, the dhamma of the Buddha, right? Because if you look at dhamma nupasana, it doesn't have all things in it. It has specific things. It has the bodhipak, the bojangas. It has the khandas. It has the uh, the uh, uh, the ayatana, the indriya. It has specific things. Why does it start with the nivarana? Right? Why does Dhamma start with... That's not the basic Dhamma. But in the teaching of the Buddha, the Nivarana have to come first. In the meditation practice, Nivarana have to come first. Anyway, that's, uh, I'll get there. I'll explain that eventually. But okay, so Kaya, Vedana, Jitta, Dhamma. Body, feelings, mind and Dhamma. We understand these four. This is the basis of our practice. Kaya, <clears throat> Kaya is actually the least important because as I said, we're not worrying about purifying the body. We don't care what happens to the body. It's it, it, it going to get old, sick and die. Everyone uh, succumbs to this in the end. You can't purify the body. If you purify the body, you have to get rid of everything, get rid of it, all of it. All that's left is maybe your gold fillings. The rest of it is all uh, blood and pus and urine and feces. If you don't wash it, it smells and so on. So we're not, we're not so concerned about purifying the body. It's just going to fall apart and, and die in the end. But, ironically, it's the one that we focus the most on. Why? Because it's also the most obvious. When we begin to meditate, the only thing you can see for sure is the body. If you've never practiced meditation before, the mind and the feelings and the emotions, all of these are hard to find. And so the easiest object of our focus is going to be the body. Now why is that important? Because the body allows us to train ourselves. It's like if you talk about a boxer. Uh, we don't have boxing here, do you? I don't know, a cricket match. You don't just go out and play cricket. You have to do some training first, right? I've never seen them train, but they must do training in cricket, right? You have to learn how to swing the bat. But you don't score any runs or what do you call them? Uh, points. You don't get any points from swinging the bat, but you have to do it first. If you're a soldier, you have to practice shooting bullets at inanimate objects. You don't get any benefit from shooting inanimate objects, but you have to train. So you get no benefit necessarily from focus. It's not actually true, but there's no immediately understood benefit from focusing on the body. But the training is uh, most effective when you focus on the body, because it's always there. This is why we have you focus on the stomach, because that's part of the body. You could focus on your feet if you want. When you walk, you focus on your feet. You can focus on any part, your back. So when you're sitting, you'll feel tension in the back. You can focus on that, that's part of the body. We focus on the stomach because it's always there and obvious. So you can try this now. Uh, I've forgotten your name. Prema, Premila? Yes. Yes. Premila, you can focus on your stomach. Yes. Put your hand on your stomach. Yes. You may not need to, but you yeah, can. Or in my mind. Oh, okay. Yeah. Some people need to put their hand there to find yeah, it. So physical. Okay. That's okay. That's a good so point. when the stomach rises, mm -hmm. just say to yourself, rising. Mm -hmm. Just practice this focusing on the mundane object. And when it falls again, say to yourself, falling, rising, falling. Because this is a new technique, so we need a training. You have to train yourself in it. You know, practice that. Practice training yourself to experience the object as it is. This is kaya, kaya nupasana. Kaye kaya nupasi viharati. 
Vedana, we've already gone over, this is when you feel pain. When you feel pain in the body, focus on the pain and say to yourself, pain, pain, pain. If you feel happy, also Vedana. And this is also important because pain will lead you to be unhappy, but happiness will lead you to greed, will lead you to attachment. You will start to think of the happiness as dependable and satisfying. And so when it's not there, you'll wonder why it's not there and you'll find a way to make it come and you'll spend all your life chasing after pleasure. And we know where that leads. That leads to addiction. No. It leads to dissatisfaction, boredom, frustration when you can't get what you want. So it's equally important to be mindful, not to get rid of the happy feelings, but to be mindful of them and to be able to let go of them as well. So when you feel happy, we have the mantra to remind ourselves happy, happy, happy. And if you feel calm, we remind ourselves calm, calm, calm. So any kind of vedana, any kind of sensation, we just remind ourselves of what it is. The third one, citta. Citta refers to the mind. And in this case, we think of it just as the thoughts. When your mind is thinking about the past or future, good thoughts, bad thoughts. We're going to take the essence for practical purposes we'll only focus on the fact that it is the mind. Whether you like the thought or dislike the thought, we put that aside for now. In regards to the mind, we'll only take the aspect of thinking. And that's easy to understand. You're sitting here and you're trying to stay with the stomach rising and falling. Or When there's nothing else, just come back again to the body. We say come back to the stomach, it's quite obvious. It's an aspect of the body that's obvious. But when your mind is distracted by thoughts, for example, then you should focus on the thoughts themselves and say to yourself, thinking, thinking, thinking. All of this will help to purify the mind. It will keep your mind from getting caught up in uh, likes and dislikes and uh, partiality and aversion and so on. So if you're thinking about the past, Instead of obsessing about it and reacting to it, worrying about it, sad about it, just say thinking. So when you come back in your body and your mm. foot is dead, what do you do? Get to the chair? No, like that's fine. <laughs> dead is actually okay. Be see, again, you're reacting to it. No, like how to well, don't react to it. Do it There's nothing wrong with it. If it's oh, dead, it's, it's not dead, it's asleep. Yeah, 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 and we say, so let, sleep, so let sleeping die. No, let sleeping dogs lie. Okay. It's not going to fall off, I promise you. But you see, you're I'm reacting. Changed. You're, you, they're all as well. I'm just I picking know, on you. Know, but you're, you're, you're reacting to it. You yes, see. Yes, so we're trying to change that. that. Well, we're trying to change that. So, so you don't I'm react. Sitting in your sadhana, meditating. Yes. So you take time. What would be ideal time for me to start such a beginner? Okay. Well, questions later. Questions later. Okay. Let me finish. I'm almost finished. Okay. Thanks. Chitta means. Um, means thoughts. So if you're thinking about the past and your husband or so on, that would be an example. Instead of obsessing over it, you'll just say to yourself, thinking, thinking. Let the thoughts come, but they're just thoughts, and you can be at peace with them. If you're thinking about the future and normally worry would arise or fear about the future, instead, just see it as thinking. Again, thinking, thinking, planning, planning, and so on. This is mind. Kaya Vedana Chitta. The fourth one, Dhamma. As I said, the first set, the most important set, is called the Nivarana. Nivarana means the hindrances. So these are things that obstruct your practice. And also in life, you can say these are hindrances in life. They keep you from succeeding, from achieving your goals, from being at peace. These five hindrances are well, they have big names. The names are sensual, uh, sensual pleasure, sensual desire, ill will, and so on. But we give them simple names: liking, disliking, drowsiness, distraction, and doubt. 
So again, you should remember these. I'd have people memorize them, but you're not my student yet, so I won't, have, won't force you to. It's just, I'm just visiting today. So liking, uh, if you like something, this creates addiction and it creates, you know, you, you, uh, you will be dissatisfied when you can't, frustrated when you can't get what you want. Disliking, disliking takes you away from, all of these things take you away from reality. But disliking is bad because it makes you suffer. When you dislike something, that's pain. That's suffering in the mind. Anger. It takes away your peace. Drowsiness is also a hindrance because you get lazy and, and, and your mind is not sharp. It's not strong. Distraction is the opposite of drowsiness. Distraction means you're too, too much energy and your mind is flitting here and there and everywhere, thinking about ten things at once also a hindrance. Doubt is a hindrance because you're not sure if you should do it, you're not sure if it's true, you're not sure what's the right way, should I do it this way, should I do it that way, also a hindrance. So the first thing we have to do in the path of the Dhamma is remove these five. Fortunately the practice to remove them is the same as with everything else. Once they're there you stop the next step you stop them from uh, recycling or proliferating. Once you have the liking, you remind yourself that's just liking. So again, just say to yourself, liking, liking, liking. If you dislike something, say disliking, disliking. Hold on to it. Don't, don't let it go on to the next step. If you feel drowsy, you wouldn't believe it, but if you are very mindful, even drowsiness will disappear. We think of drowsiness as you're missing something, but it's not really true. Drowsiness is mean the, the mind and the brain have gone into the mode where they're trying to tell you to go to sleep. They're saying, we need to sleep now. But you can tell them, no, no, just see it as it is and, and ignore them. And you'll find the mind shuts off again. It turns off that switch of drowsiness. You have energy again. If you're distracted, it means you're thinking too much, your mind is not focused, then as well you can be mindful of it as distracted, distracted, and this will focus the mind. All of these imbalance, these are all imbalances of the mind. And mindfulness will balance the mind in a pure way to just experience the object as it is. So if you're distracted or if you're worried, you can say worried, worried. And if you have doubt or confusion, same thing. Say to yourself, doubting, doubting. This one is fun because you think, well, should I, should I really do practice in this way? But as soon as you say doubting, doubting, the doubt disappears and you have no problem anymore. When you doubt something, what you should do is throw away what you are doing. Forget about what you're doing and focus on the doubt. And when you watch the doubt and let it unfold, you'll find that the answer comes by itself. The doubt disappears. Say to yourself, doubting, doubting, doubting. These are the five hindrances. Basically that's the, well for, for a beginner meditator that's the important, uh, the most important Dhamma to keep in mind. Once you've gotten rid of the hindrances, once you practice in this way your mind will become free from the hindrances. Uh, then you have to be aware of the senses as well. So the next Dhamma that we focus on is the seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. So you can also keep that in mind. Once your mind is calm and, and clear, sometimes you might see something. With your eyes closed you might see pictures or colors or lights. Um, see some image of the Buddha or a crystal ball, a crystal or or a color white or, or some color of some sort. All of these are, are byproducts of the practice caused by strong good concentration. But just like everything else we have to keep our minds clear. We can't become partial to them or attached to them. And so when you see them just remind yourself seeing, seeing, seeing. If you hear anything, hearing, hearing. If you smell, smelling, smelling. Tasting, tasting, feeling, feeling. 
it's quite a simple concept, but to do is almost, for most people it's almost impossible. Because we don't want to do this. We want to grasp, we want to cling, we want to chase, we want to judge. We want to judge everything, and that's the problem. The only way you can do this is if you're ready to stop judging, if you're ready to just experience, to just be. The problem, I think, is we think we're already just being. You think you're all sitting here. We think, we think we're all sitting here just people, no? Look around, we're just a bunch of people. I don't know what's going on in your mind, but the truth is that probably in all everyone's mind there's judging, judging, judging going on of everything. In our, in our minds, are, we can't stop this. We're not just sitting here. We're not here enjoying each other's company, not, not all the time. Our minds are wandering in here and there and, and, and judging. No? So this practice will, will work to, to do away with that, to help us to see things as they are, not how we want them to be or how we don't want them to be. And once we see things how they are, then we will uh, free ourselves. So all of the teachings of the Buddha will come into play. Then we will, then we will reach nibbana, nibbana, nirvana. Then we will become free from suffering. Then we will become enlightened. Because enlightenment means to, well, two things. First, to shine a light on something, no? It can also mean to become lighter, to not be weighed down by our judgments. But it, the light, the idea of shining a light means to, to understand and see things clearly. Because without light you can't see. So an enlightened being is someone who see th sees things as they are. They don't change to become someone else. They just know the truth. And so this is the problem, is that we don't focus our minds on the truth. We want to chase away the truth. When we have pain, we don't want to experience the pain. When we have bad thoughts, we don't want to experience the bad thoughts. We want to only have these types of experience, not have these types of experience. So our minds are not open to the whole spectrum of experience and reality. I don't know what time it is, but I was hoping we'd have time for meditation. What time is it? 10 past 10. So I have until 11 to talk, right? No, I'm just kidding. I was supposed to talk till 10, right? That was my time limit. All right. Well, then I, I, I'll do what I'm supposed to do and open it up for questions. So if you have questions, you can now, you can now ask the questions. Uh, in the meantime, you're welcome to sit and close your eyes and meditate. And once there are no questions, then just close your eyes and meditate and, and we'll all just do meditation before 11 o'clock. And at 11 o'clock we will finish. Yes, ma'am. Well, can I, if I can clarify, it's not exactly holding on, not in that sense, but it's holding on in the sense, while it's there, you, you, uh, you hold on to just the reality of it. But, once you've taken the next step, don't try to hold on to the old experience. If you do like or dislike, then you should hold on to that. Okay, but if, if it goes to the next step, hold on to that. You know, you're, you're, so you're not forcing your mind back to something that's gone already. That's all. Anyway, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And so, 
something to help me there to without getting overwhelmed to stay uh, Well you don't need distance. You just need objectivity. The reason you need distance is because you're not capable of objectivity. Right? So that's in life as well. If 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 I come here and I know there's someone who I really don't like, then I'll go and stay in the other room. Because I know if I come in the same room with him, we'll shout and yell and, and fight with each other. So the distance, when you can't be objective, you need to keep your distance. If there's someone who you're not ha comfortable with, it's the same in life. It's the same in meditation. The only way to be, to not judge is to stay away from it. And that's why samatha meditation is so attractive. Because you just ignore the object. You just avoid the objects. You have pain, well, well, think of something else. Think of something comfortable. But th that's the difference here, is we're not trying to be distant. We're trying to be objective. So to answer your question simply, yes, it will help, absolutely. Once you can be objective about it, you know, just see it as pain or, or, or whatever the experience is. If you hear a sound that you normally don't like, hearing, hearing, and you're objective. Not distance. Distance, I think, is the wrong word. You, ha it's, you have to change your reaction, right? If you, if you study Abhidhamma, first there's the experience, then there's the reaction. So the experience is no problem. You can't change that. Experience is experience. It's this that we're worried about. You, 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 you can't, there's no distancing yourself from experience. You have the experience. And that's, that's ethically... Uh, Meaningless, or ethically neutral. Who said that? It has no ethical value. There's no. It's not good. It's not bad. It, that doesn't change. The next moment, or one of the next moments, is when you judge it. You say this is good. This is bad. This is me. This is mine. I like it. I dislike it. So, on. this is what we have to change, and that's where mindfulness takes effect. Once you experience it, you remind yourself this is not good. This is not bad. You say, this is this. That's all. I wouldn't worry so much about distance. In fact, I think that's a wrong idea, because distance leads people, when, then when you have pain, you try to run away from it. Just running away the mind, not running away the Well, either way is running away. It's like you have, you're a student in a classroom, and, if you, le and you leave the class classroom, you don't learn anything. You have a good lesson here to learn, and you're just running away from it. But it has much to teach you. Because dukkha, dukkha satcha has nothing to do with, with veda, with pain. Dukkha satcha means everything. It's the understanding that everything, nothing is worth clinging to. Sabe dhamma na lang abhinive saya. No dhamma is worth clinging to. Can we, where would I get that mantra which you just said? Which one? I know, it's much nicer than pain. No, pain. I gotta do that. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Can I share my story for this video? But I'm not going to give it to you because pain is a much better mantra. <laughs> oh, God, no, it's mental. Oh, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. May I share my story to help you? Afterwards, I have, I have limited time. Thank you. Afterwards, there'll be much will, time. I will be able to. We need Thank to take questions. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, I find that I, all of a sudden I'm thinking what's going in my mind and then I get, you know, I get thought, I don't think my thoughts, I, I just sit and I get a thought. But all of a sudden then I get a pain. So I concentrate on the pain and then it goes away, I think something has come, like uh, when I concentrate on pain. So I find that I'm doing Satya Satipatthana at the same time, all four aspects of Satipatthana. Am I doing it right or wrong? I, I can't judge, you know, you're asking me. Yes, I, I'm yes. No, but I'm, but yes, different, uh, okay. Um, but first I have to say is that uh, different teachers will teach the Satipatthana differently. So if you, you might get confused by the different interpretations. My interpretation is, as I said, you need to use the mantra. So if you're not reminding yourself, the word sati comes from the, the, the root sar, which is the same as sarana or sanya even, I think. Um, but it, yeah, because the, 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 the cause of sati is tira sanya, stira, you say, you know, tira, which means firm sanya. 
So it's this re recognition, but, but reminding yourself. When you reaffirm that, that recognition, so this is pain, you reaffirm that by saying to yourself, pain, pain. That's what it means to have sati. So if you're not doing that, in my tradition we say you, you haven't, you're not practicing satipatthana according to our tradition. Now, when you talk about, you're asking the question of practicing all four, practicing one. Well, you see they happen one by one, right? It's not exactly at the same moment, but point taken, the answer is to pick whichever one is clearest. You don't, you don't have to worry that there are many. They don't actually happen at the same time. That's not possible. But they're very quick, and it seems to be at the same time. No problem. Pick whichever one is clearest. Because we're not, it's not magic. It's not like a video game where you have to shoot up all the enemies. You know? and probably many of you don't play video games. But <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it's about changing your habits and learning. It's about studying. And it should be done leisurely and it should be done with, with, with um, patience and, and, and peacefully. You know, you should be comfortable in it. So slowly try to learn the truth. So it doesn't matter that you catch everything, don't catch everything. The mantra is, is, is the tool that we use to see things as they are and allow wisdom to arise. And the wisdom will come by itself. You'll start to see things as they are. It's like they're telling you something and you're not listening. Mostly we're not listening. We say, oh, shut up, I'm going somewhere else. But do you focus on it and you say, tell me. Tell me what you have to say and they will tell you. They will tell you three things. You know the three things that they will tell you? That's what they will tell you. Yeah. Well, impermanence isn't a practice. No, this is again putting the cart before the horse. What we practice, and this is very important to get in your mind, what we practice is vipassana meditation based on the four foundations of mindfulness. The practice is satipatthana. The result is vipassana. The practice is not vipassana. You don't practice anitya dukkaya anatmaya. You don't practice this. This is what comes from the practice. So dhammanupassana isn't anitya. It's not in there. Dhammanupassana is focusing on realities, focusing on the, the aggregates and the senses, but mostly it means following the teachings of the Buddha. Yeah, and using, using the, the teachings of the Buddha as meditation objects, the nivarana, the, everything, the bodhjanga, everything. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Well, you can't help that. <laughs> you listen. Yeah. That's right. Well, you listen and you decide for yourself. You can also practice. You know, with the Kalama Sutta, the Buddha said, "Don't listen just because this teacher says or that teacher says." You know, when you know for yourself, then you get rid of you. You follow that. Um, I give you my argument. I've laid it out here. I've tried to explain why I think this is the way the Buddha ha would have us teach. Why I think this is very appropriate. Mantra meditation has been around since before the time of the Buddha. The usage of a mantra was the accepted form of uh, meditation at the time of the Buddha. Um, certainly is what they were practicing in India. So the idea that this is something new or foreign or non-meditative non or that you can meditate without a mantra, it's, uh, I don't understand it so, so well. I think it's because um, we hear about meditation and we hear about the idea of what meditation is and we think immediately that it's just sitting there peacefully. You don't want to hear that it's work, that it takes effort, that it can be painful, that it can be unpleasant. You don't want to hear that. You think, well, why would I want to do it then? It's supposed to be, help me escape suffering. So we get an, a pre-prejudice about the meditation. We prejudge it, thinking that it should be nityai, sukai, atmai. <laughs> Absolutely. Even though we've, even if we've heard a nityai, dukai, and atmai, we still think meditation should be stable, pleasant, and controllable. 
And anytime your meditation is unstable, unpleasant or uncontrollable, something's wrong, my meditation is no good. So, when people try to use this mantra, if you use a mantra based on, on God or Buddha, it's quite pleasant. S stable, pleasant, controllable. Because it's a concept. Concepts are... Is it, actually, the Buddha is a bad... Uh, bad because technically speaking that's not true, but may, you know, practically speaking it is true. The, Buddha, the image of the Buddha is just a concept. The person of the Buddha is just a concept. Um, so it, you can control it, you can find stability, it lasts forever. Every time you think, yeah, Buddha's still there, still, so it's permanent. So that one, people like that kind of meditation. But when you use the mantra on something that's impermanent, it doesn't become permanent. When you use it on something that's unpleasant, it doesn't become pleasant. When you use it on something that's uncontrollable, it doesn't become controllable. It helps you see that samsara is impermanent suffering and non-self. That's what it's designed to do. People do it and they're not happy with it because it shows them, it, it's, it shows them things they don't want to see, no matter what. But I guarantee it will show you anitya dukkaya natmai. Let's put it that way. If you want to doubt what I'm saying, then you doubt it this way. Is it showing you a nitya dukkaya natmai? You practice it, and that's how you should judge it. If a meditation just makes you peaceful and happy, then either A, you're enlightened, or B, you're practicing samatha. Right? Because if you're practicing vipassana, it will be full of unpleasant things. It won't always be unpleasant, but it will challenge you. It's meant to challenge you. It's meant to enlighten you. Enlightenment is not just, not just walking from here to the corner store. Enlightenment is changing who we are from the back of our hand to the front of our hand. Night to day. In terms of not to judge, mm. um, to me it is possible in a, in a specific time, maybe in this kind of a setting and Mm -hmm. um, it becomes a survival need. Mm -hmm. You need to uh, judge people and understand that these people are this and mm -hmm. to, be able to avoid them. That's not judgment. That, the word judgment is, is just a word. But it's just, the word judge is just a word, but it means two different things. Judge can mean like a judge. A judge figures out who's, who's innocent and guilty. That's perfectly valid. That's necessary. You have to be a judge of everything in your life. A good judge of character, we say, you know. Judging is very important for monks as well. I have to judge you all. I have to judge you when you ask this question so I can give you the right answer. I have to judge. But that's a different kind of judging from um, partiality. What I meant by judgment, not judging, is I meant by not being partial. The agati, you know, you're partial. So if your judgments are based on uh, chanda, which means desire or attraction, partiality towards something. Uh, if it's based on, on uh, anger or disliking of something. If it's based on fear, uh, you're afraid of something so you judge it. Yeah, or if it's based on, on uh, delusion, you know, arrogance or conceit or so on, or, or self-esteem, low self-esteem, high self-esteem, this kind of thing. If it's based on partiality, uh, that's what we mean by judgment. We mean liking and disliking, mainly liking, disliking, or arrogance and conceit. That kind of judgment. It's different, and that's not necessary in life. It's not necessary to get angry. It's not necessary to be attached to things. In fact, these hurt you in the world just as much as they do in the Dhamma. You know, if you get angry, you can't, you can't be a good judge. Right? So. You have to understand what I mean by judging. I don't mean all kinds of judging that we mean by the word. You have to be a good judge. But to be a good judge, you can't be prejudiced. So you can't judge in the way I, I was trying to say. So, so please don't misunderstand. You have to be a good judge. But to be a good judge, you can't judge. Understand? Is that sort of clear? Oh, yeah. Well, but maybe put aside the word judge and just say don't be, uh, don't be partial, and to be impartial, right? A judge cannot be partial. If you have two people and the judge likes this person, that person shouldn't be a judge. 
They should recuse themselves from the case because they like this person and they're never going to be impartial. So to be a good judge you can't be partial. It's the same with life. If you want, if, if, if something happens in your life, you have a situation and you get angry at it, you can't be partial, you can't be wise about it. You're, you're, you're acting based on your anger. That won't, it won't bring a good result. You'll react too quickly. For example, pain is a good one because when you react to the pain, you're actually hurting your body. You know, the, 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 the anger, we say, well, that's good because it helps you get away from it, but it doesn't actually. If you have pain in the neck, you're going to go like this a lot, right? That actually makes it worse. That actually hurts your neck more and more. It's amazing when you're a meditator, you have all these aches and pains, and you just let them be, and very quickly they just disappear. Whereas if someone is not mindful and they go like this, the pain can last for days and weeks and months and get, become chronic pain. I don't know why doctors don't realize this, or maybe they do, but that's really it. If you just stopped reacting to it, the pain, this isn't, you know, the pain itself wasn't a problem until you started getting upset about it and making it worse. When you're, when you're angry, you move quickly, you move irration um, you know, irrationally or, or, or um, without mindfulness. And so as a result, you end up hurting your body. I mean, that's a good example of how it doesn't help you. But emotionally, mentally, it's the same thing. If, if you're angry at someone, you're going to speak r harshly to them, ruin a friendship, hurt your friendship, make other people think, oh, that person's not very nice, you're going to lose your, your status in society, and so on and so on. You know, people don't like angry people. Greed as well. I mean, this is part of learning what karma is. Karma is this on a very basic level. Karma is that when you have the neck pain and you, you go like this. That's bad karma that's leading you to dita dhamma vedaniya. You know, you're, you're experiencing it in the here and now. It's not something you have to wait for next life. You're making karma and it's hurting you. Stress in the, in the back and so on. If you're just mindful of it as tension, it disappears. People who go to chiropractors and get massages and everything, they don't have to. I always joke about with my Thai students that uh, they come to Thailand to get a Thai massage. And Thai massage is apparently very painful. And so they willingly put up with all this pain because afterwards they feel so wonderful. But because they're only attacking the body, only removing the tension in the body, the mind builds up the tension again and a week later they have to go back for another Thai massage. And I say, well this is, a, this is the best Thai massage you'll ever get because it's very painful to have to sit through it. But you're also working out the tension in the mind. You're letting the mind work through its tension, not reacting to it, not feeding it. And once the tension in the mind is gone, the pain will disappear as well. You'll see, it's amazing how the tension I used to have in my back when I used to sit in meditation, it never comes anymore. Because I know how to deal with pain when it comes. I don't get tense about it. When something comes up that would normally make you upset, you say, oh look, here I'm getting upset. And then it's gone. You don't make more of anything than it is. Everything is about uh, how, it, how you react to it and the snowballing. We, in, you don't have snowballs here. But in Canada, the nature of snow, for those of you who don't know, is that if you have a ball of snow and you roll it in the snow, it collects more snow. And more and more until it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and you build a snowman. That's how you build a snowman, because you put one on top of the other. But if it gets really big, it gets dangerous because it'll roll down the hill and it can... Anyway, so we have this term snowballing, which means getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Exponentially even, I think. Don't do that. To stop that, you have to break the chain of, of, of expansion. It's to stop and put an equal sign in. You know. So, uh, you know the formula, reiterate, are you engineers, any engineers here? You have the reiterating formula, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But at some point you just put an equal sign in, and then it just stays the same. It doesn't get any worse. And in fact disappears, because it doesn't, isn't being fed. Any more questions? Otherwise, we'll have a little bit of meditation. Yes, sir.
אוקיי. אהה, שור. אוקיי. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, you'll ha I'll have to give a brief explanation because otherwise it would take an hour. So, uh, Buddha Dharma, Dharma, Buddha Dharma in the most conventional sense refers to that which the Buddha held to be true. Dhar, the root Dhar means to hold or to carry. So the Kshatriyas had the Kshatriya Dharma, the uh, Brahmins had the Brahman Dharma. And this is what in the Bhagavad Gita caused Krishna to say, you know, the warriors can kill because that's their Dharma. And so they held this to be proper. You know, it's proper for a Kshatriya to kill. That's what they believe. In... Uh, in Buddhism, so when the Buddha came along, there was this idea of a dharma, and it had evolved to mean the teachings of that teacher, or the beliefs. So, you know, the six teachers in the time of the Buddha, they all had their own dharma. And what that means is they all had views and beliefs and, and opinions that they held to be true. This was their dharma. The Buddha also had his dharma. So in a conventional sense, Buddha Dharma just means those things that the Buddha taught. Now, the Buddha claimed that what he was teaching was not, uh, was not his, but it was simply reality. So the word Dharma came to take on another word, and it means that which holds, Dhar again, that which holds its own uh, truth, its own nature. So dharma came to mean nature as well. But what this means is, <clears throat> for example, a concept is not really a dharma in this sense because it doesn't hold its own nature. If I talk about um, Colombo or, yeah, I talk about Colombo and then you say, well, Colombo has its own nature. It, it is what it is. And I say, well, what if I mean Colombo 50 years ago? Well, then it has a different nature. Or 100 years ago, or 500 years ago. You know, uh, as a, a ver the nature of a concept can change. But the nature of reality, of a dharma, doesn't change. It holds that reality. So, for example, pain holds its own reality. This is the Dharma. The Dharma of the Buddha was referring to those things that are real. You know, pain is real, it has real characteristics, those don't change based on what you want. You know, pain is not actually bad, that is not part of its Dharma, but pain is impermanent, suffering and non-self. Pain is not something you should cling to. Uh, thoughts, you know, and so the Buddha laid out what are the real Dharmas. In brief, that's the, 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 an answer to the question, what is the Buddha Dharma? The Buddha Dharma is an explanation of reality. One more point to make is that reality according to the Buddha seems quite clearly to be, even though the Buddha never said it exactly like this, but as we understand it today, um, experiential. Because nowadays people have come up with new, since Descartes, people have come up with new maybe even before that, but in the West, since Descartes, people came up with a new way of looking at reality that was non-experiential. So they have a, this is a three-dimensional world, and the fourth dimension is time, and so on. So you have time-space that is independent of experience. That's not Buddhism. The, Buddha's te the Dharma, according to the Buddha, reality is our experience. Reality is seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. That's the Buddha Dharma. How, that, how my teaching, I think is what you're asking, leads to see the Four Noble Truths. Well, see, the Buddha taught that in this reality, he, he, he focus, or his focus 
the things that he actually taught to other people was only a small part of that. So when he taught Buddhism, when he taught the Buddha Dharma, he only taught that part of the or he only taught that part of reality that was actually useful to people. So he differentiated between truth and noble truth. Right? Truth is many kinds of truth, you know. What temperature is it right now? That's a truth, but who cares? Right? That's not really important. What is the cause of suffering? Well, that is much more important. So the Buddha taught the four noble truths. Dukkha, what is Dukkha, what is Samuttaya, what is Nirodha, what is the Magga. And he gave, a, he assigned a, a, a task for each of the four Arya Satcha. You know this, they have the Satcha, Kitcha, Kata. It's familiar to anyone? If you study the Four Noble Truths, many people don't realize this, but there's more than just the four things. There's twelve altogether, right? You know this, the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta? Evanti Parivatang Dwadasa Karang Dwadasa Dwadasa means twelve. The Noble Truths are twelve. Four times three. Dukkha has Satcha Kitta Kata, Satcha Kitta Kata, Samudaya, you know, the cause of suffering has Satcha Kitta, Kitta Kata. They have three aspects to them. Satcha means the truth of it. It's true that this is suffering. Kitta means what you should do in regards to that truth. And Kata means it's done. Only once it's done can you say you understand that truth. Or once you've done what needs to be done. This is important because the Four Noble Truths are not equal. So when you ask, how do you realize the Four Noble Truths, it's more than just knowing the Four. It's actually performing the task associated with each of the Four. Most importantly, the first one. If you read through them, I don't have so much time, so I'll focus on the first one. The first task is to know thoroughly, parinyaya, parinyayanti me bhikkhuve. It is to be, pari means Pari is like parinibbana. Pari means like a circle, uh, means completely. Nyaya means to know, should be known. So it should be known thoroughly. Why I say this is most important? Because this is the only, or this is, um, well, compared with the second noble truth. The first noble truth is to know clearly, to know completely. The second noble truth is not to know clearly. You don't have to know clearly the cause of suffering. That's not the task. You try to know clearly something is suffering. Why is that? Why is what I'm saying true? Because once you know that something is suffering, do you want it? Do you crave for it? No. You don't. I mean, if, if, you, if you're carrying a hot, a hot coal in your hand, once you realize it's a hot coal, you drop it right away. You don't need to think about it. You don't have to know that something is causing you suffer. Uh, you don't have to know. You don't have to understand that craving is the cause of suffering. You have to abandon craving, and so the task for the second one is to abandon the craving. The task for the first one is to know suffering. Task for the second is to abandon craving, and they're accomplished in the same way. How does my teaching lead to it? Once you is exactly what I've been saying. I think my whole talk has been about understanding suffering. When you have the pain, what do you do? Stop running away from it. Try to understand it. Once you understand that experience, in fact, even rising and falling is anityai dukkai anatmai. Once you understand it for what it is, you will have no craving for things to be this way or that way. You will not want for things to change. You, you will be content with things as they are. You'll learn how to live and to dance rather than to fight. It's the difference between being a boxer and being a dancer. A dancer moves with the rhythm. A boxer fights against it, changes it, forces it, violence. A dancer is not violent. Sati is like a dance of life. You learn to dance with the rhythm of life. Something comes, okay, you move. Something comes, you, you're, you're, you're not out of harmony with reality. So, 
My practice, I claim this practice that I've been explaining to you, which I say is the Buddha's practice, leads to see the Four Noble Truths because it helps you to understand the truth of the dharmas, the truth of nature, that they are not worth clinging to, uh, that they are not good or bad, that they simply are, they arise and they cease. And once you see that, you give up craving. Once you give up craving, you have no suffering, so this is nirodha. Uh, and all of this is accomplished by the Eightfold Noble Path. So the claim that I make is that the teaching that I'm giving you is the Eightfold Noble Path. And that would take time to explain as well, I don't have that time. But in brief, I hope that has given some answer to the question. Right? I think it's a very deep topic. Um, I was hoping we'd have more time for meditation. Do we still have five minutes? We have 15 minutes, then why don't we do 15 minutes of meditation, I'll stop it there. And I'd like you to all to try this, to try using a mantra not for something spiritual, but find a mantra for the experience as you have it. If you want to practice for the first time, you can try focusing on the stomach, it's a good training object, helps you get used to the idea. But whatever you do, find a mantra to remind yourself of the object as it is. I think we can stop the recording, no?